Thank you everyone for allowing us to have a quick break. Uh, we are now ready to start part two of the COVID-19 vaccine session today, which we'll start with Dr. Chris Taylor from CDC, who will provide updates on COVID-19 hospitalizations from COVID-Net. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, um, next slide, please. Um, so to start, this figure shows population-based rates of COVID-19-associated hospitalizations from COVID-Net, the COVID-19-associated hospitalization surveillance network. All, hospitaliz all hospitalizations captured in COVID-Net have a positive SARS-CoV-2 test during hospitalization or within 14 days prior to admission. Um, on this figure, rates of older adults indicated by the solid yellow and dashed blue lines for adults ages 65 to 74 and 75 years and older, respectively, have been highest throughout the pandemic. Rates of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations for both adults and children and adolescents are looked at more closely in the next two slides. Next slide. This slide shows two figures. The left figure shows the rates of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations among adults by age group from March 2020 through February 2023. The figure on the right in the red box is at the same scale as the figure on the left, but includes only data from the most recent six months of August 2022 through February 2023. In the most recent six months, rates among adults ages 75 years and older, indicated by the dashed blue line, have remained elevated relative to younger adult age groups. For both the Delta and early Omicron peaks in January 2021 and January 2022, respectively, rates among adults ages 75 years and older, the dashed blue line, were about two times as high as those in the next youngest age group, adults 65 to 74 years, indicated by the solid yellow line. For the last six months, however, rates among adults ages 75 years and older have been three times as high relative to adults 65 to 74 years. Next slide, please. This figure also shows two, this slide also shows two figures. The left figure shows the rates of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations by pediatric age groups from March 2020 through February 2023. The figure on the right, again, in the red box is at the same scale as the figure on the left, but includes only data from the most recent six months of August 22 through February 23. In the last six months, rates among children less than six months of age, indicated by the dashed dark blue line, have remained elevated relative to older children and adolescents. Next slide. Again, this slide shows two figures. The figure on the left shows the proportion of hospitalizations comprised of adult age groups from March 2020 through February 2023. In the figure on the left, the proportion of hospitalizations comprised of adults 75 years and older, indicated by the yellow area at the top of the figure, um, has increased steadily since the summer of 2021. The figure on the right in the red box, again, in the same scale as the figure on the left, but with data only from the most recent six months, shows that about 40% of all adult COVID-19 hospitalizations in the past six months have been among adults ages 75 years and older, with 60% of all hospitalizations among adults among ages 75 years and older. Next slide. On this slide, the left figure shows the proportion of hospitalizations comprised of pediatric AIDS groups, again from March 2020 through February 2023. Figure on the left shows the proportions of hospitalizations comprised of infants less than six months of age, indicated by the green area on the bottom, have increased steadily since March of 2022. The figure on the right, again, the most recent six months of data, um, shows that infants less than six months of age, still the green area, have comprised more hospitalizations than all other pediatric age groups. Over the last six months, 25 to 30% of all COVID-19 associated hospitalizations among children and adolescents have been among these infants less than six months of age. Next slide. This figure shows the proportion of hospitalizations where COVID-19 is a likely reason for admission by age group and period of COVID variant predominance 
for June 2020 through November 2022. Reason for admission is determined by trained COVIDnet surveillance officers using an established al algorithm. As a reminder, all COVIDnet hospitalizations have a lab-confirmed positive SARS-CoV-2 test during hospitalization or within 14 days before hospital admission. Hospitalizations where the admission is noted as likely due to trauma, obstetrics or labor and delivery, psychiatric admissions requiring acute medical care, and inpatient surgery or procedures are categorized as such. Hospitalizations where the chief complaint includes fever, respiratory illness, COVID-like illness, or suspicion for COVID-19 are classified as having COVID-19 as a likely reason for admission. Hospitalizations where the medical chart specifically indicates that COVID-19 was an incidental finding or that the admission was likely not COVID-related are also categorized as such. For hospitalizations where another reason for admission is specified in free text, COVID-net clinicians examine the specified reasons and further classify. The chart displays the proportion of COVID-19-associated hospitalizations with COVID-19 as a likely reason for admission among three pediatric and three adult age groups, as well as overall by periods of variant predominance. As indicated by the set of columns second from the left, about 80 to 90% of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations among children ages less than four years had COVID-19 as a likely reason for admission across all variant periods. Older children, ages 5 to 11 years, ranged between 70 to 95%. Adolescents, ages 12 to 7 years, had the lowest proportion of hospitalizations with COVID-19 as a likely reason for admission, between 50 and 60% for the Omicron predominant periods beginning in December 2021. Among this group, many admissions are psychiatric admissions requiring acute medical care, with more than 25 or 35% of hospitalizations in some months. Adults ages 18 to 49 had a similarly low proportion of hospitalizations with COVID as a likely reason for admission, between 50 and 70% during the Omicron period. Among this group, many admissions are due to labor and delivery, with more than 25 or 30% of hospitalizations attributed to that in some months. Among adults ages 50 years and older, in the two rightmost set of columns, between 80 and 90% of hospitalizations have COVID as a likely reason for admission across all variant periods examined. Next slide. This chart describes the prevalence of underlying medical conditions among non-pregnant hospitalized adults ages 18 years and older where COVID-19 is a likely reason for admission based on the definitions provided in the previous slide. Data are presented for June through November 2022, the most recent six months for which complete data are available. As indicated from left to right, the most common underlying medical conditions are chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, and neurologic disorders. Chronic lung disease is prevalent in more than two thirds of all adult COVID-19 associated hospitalizations, cardiovascular disease present in more than half, diabetes, obesity, and neurologic disorders in about one third, and renal disease in about one quarter. 96% of hospitalized adults have at least one underlying medical condition. Next slide, please. This chart describes the prevalence of underlying medical conditions in COVID-19 associated hospitalizations among children and adolescents ages 17 years and younger, again in June through November 2022, the most recent six months for which complete data are available. These data are limited to those hospitalizations where COVID-19 is a likely primary reason for admission. The most common underlying medical conditions are asthma, prematurity, feeding tube dependence, and obesity. It's important to note that asthma and prematurity are underlying medical conditions in more than 10% of these pediatric cases. In contrast to adults, 49% of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations among children and adolescents have no recorded underlying medical conditions. Next slide, please. 
This chart further describes the prevalence of underlying medical conditions by pediatric age group, where COVID-19 is a likely reason for admission. There are some notable differences between younger and older pediatric age groups. Among children less than two years of age in the leftmost cluster of bars, prematurity, indicated by the orange bar, is by far the most common underlying condition recorded in nearly 20% of all hospitalizations. The next most common is feeding tube dependence at 5%, indicated by the gray bar. Among the three older pediatric age groups, the most common underlying medical conditions differ. While the order of these most common conditions vary by age group, the most common are asthma, feeding tube dependence, obesity, immunocompromising conditions, and chronic lung disease, not including asthma and not related to prematurity. Next slide. This figure shows the percentage of hospitalizations by vaccination status and age group for October and November 2022, the two months of data available after the updated bivalent booster dose was approved. More than half of hospitalized children ages 5 to 17 years were unvaccinated, as indicated by the orange portions of the columns. One third of adults ages 18 to 49 years remain unvaccinated, and less than 25% for adults 50 years of age and older. Very small proportions of hospitalizations have been among persons vaccinated with the updated bivalent booster, as indicated by the yellow portions near the tops of the columns. Next slide, please. This figure displays age-adjusted rates of COVID-19-associated hospitalizations by vaccination status for adults ages 18 years and older from January 2021 through December 2022. The monthly rates among unvaccinated adults are depicted by the solid green line and were the highest of all vaccination status groups for every month. The purple line shows monthly rates of hospitalizations among adults who are vaccinated. The vaccination status depicted by the purple line changes over time as the vaccination recommendations and the status of the adults included in this group also changed over time, which um, is reflected by the different um, dashed line pattern in the purple line. The most recent data, most notably in November and December 2022, depicts rates of hospitalization among unvaccinated adults, the green line, adults who receive the updated bivalent booster dose, the orange line, and all other adults who received at least a primary series of vaccine but had not received the updated bivalent booster dose, or the dotted purple line. In December 2022, Compared to adults who received an updated bivalent booster dose, the monthly rates of hospitalization were 16 times higher among unvaccinated adults and 2.6 times higher among vaccinated adults who had not received an updated bivalent booster dose. Next slide. Um, I wanted to acknowledge all the folks who um, helped um, the enormous amount of data that goes into these portions of the presentations, including my colleagues on the ResNet team, as well as many others in Corvid, our ResNet partners, as well as state, local, and territory health um, department partners. And I hope these data um, are um, seen as helpful, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. This presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Paling. All right. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for this um, tremendous um, presentation and for your entire team. You did show a ton of data. I really appreciated um, your last slide about the monthly adjusted rates of hospitalization by vaccination status for adults. And um, my question is, I do recognize that the um, pediatric um, um, recommendations have not been as long, but do you have a similar slide for children? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so these data um, from this slide are uh, posted publicly. The, the figure that I showed again for adults is age adjusted. Um, I included that one because that one has the data on the bivalent booster dose. Um, we have a quality standard um, for the COVID net data where a certain proportion of the underlying 
COVID net catchment population has to reach um, um, a level of vaccination in order for our rates to be considered stable. And our most recent data that we have analyzed, um, the pediatric groups um, have not yet reached um, that standard for us to be able to include them. We were hoping, we, we hope with um, the data that we just received a few days ago, um, that we'll be able to start um, displaying those data. Um, so the data that are posted, um, we have um, sort of the 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 pre um, updated booster dose categories of unvaccinated as well as vaccinated um, plus or minus a booster dose. Um, but we aren't we have not yet been able to display the data um, showing the rates among those that have received the updated bivalent booster dose. Ms. McNally. Thank you. I really think that this slide highlights for us the importance of continuing to think about how to encourage vaccine acceptance. And I want to say that having the countermeasure injury compensation program working well is an important part to vaccine acceptance. And so I want to encourage the expeditious review of claims made as it relates to vaccination and the continued development of an injury table uh, as, as you're working through these issues. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Ms. McNally, a really important one. Dr. Long. I'm wondering um, how you're thinking about this still 16-fold higher hospitalization rate in unvaccinated with the current transmissibility of um, coronavirus and the likelihood that what percentage of adults have had a first infection, you'd think they'd act more like vaccinated, maybe not boosted or vaccinated. So how are you thinking about this, this, this retention of 16-fold higher and what do we think are the current seroprevalence rates in adults of natural uh, infection? That, that's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, I can't speak immediately to the um, seroprevalence. I, we do know, um, and we, we've discussed um, within our team, it's, you know, because we are looking, obviously, these rates among the unvaccinated folks are higher. Um, but we also do know that you know that there is immunity um, provided by um, infection, and so we aren't able to adjust for that. Um, we we have the vaccination status, but with um, at home tests and um, you know a variety of other data sources, we're not able to include um, prior infection into this um, figure in, into the data. Um, but that it, that is a limitation, um, and it's one that as as more people got vaccinated, especially um, um, in some of the older groups where there's very high levels of vaccination, um, we know that it it's hard to um, you know say for certain exactly what this means with diminishing numbers of adults who remain um, unvaccinated, um, and so I, I I don't I don't have a a solution, but it is something that we recognize as being very important. Um, and as we continue to collect these data, it's something that we have to reckon with um, as, um, again, as more and more people become um, vaccinated, um, potentially with um, um, one potential way of looking at this in the future is um, doing it in a seasonal way. So not perhaps not ever unvaccinated, but unvaccinated for that particular season. Um, that might be one way to look at that. Um, that is not necessarily the way we're going to go, but that is a potential um, option if um, patterns for COVID vaccination recommendations um, mirror those um, more closely, like um, something we see for influenza. Dr. Daly. Yeah, I, I want to jump in here. I guess when I look at this, I assume that the bulk of the unvaccinated have been infected. And so then this to me indicates that um, prior infection doesn't give you much 
immunity. It gives you some, but is it short lasting or it's only against the variant that you're exposed to? And so, I mean, I think I would be, I, I think we, we want to, if the data supports it, we want to be clear with the message that prior infection is not adequate for protection against future hospitalization from COVID. Uh, Dr. Lear. Thank you. Could we go to slide seven, please? I regularly have patients and even colleagues who sort of say, well, they don't quite trust the hospitalization data because lots of people are being hospitalized with COVID for other reasons. But if my interpretation of what you're showing here is for the over 65 year olds, for everyone who is hospitalized and had COVID during the hospitalization, over 90% of those admissions were related as the primary likely reason for admission was COVID. So they weren't just COVID incidental, they were admitted because of COVID. Is that an accurate interpretation? Yes, based on our algorithm, that is correct. Um, we, I will um, add that this um, can be a conservative algorithm, um, but um, we're actually doing a more expansive um, analysis um, looking at this more closely from a couple different angles, looking at treatment, looking at um, primary and secondary ICD-10 CM diagnosis codes, um, in addition to this algorithm um, with the data provided through the uh, medical abstraction of the the, the the abstraction of the medical chart. Um, but yes, and, and you can see those patterns for the older adults as well as for the very young children. Um, Dr. Peeling. Um, I wanted, um, I really appreciated slides eight and nine talking about the underlying medical conditions. And if I am understanding Dr. Cotton correctly, I believe 3% of the U.S. population is immunocompromised, and that increases with age. And we can see there is a significant disproportionate um, hospitalizations among the immunocompromised, both in children and adults. And that that is really important and um, highlights the importance of timely vaccination among all. Thank you. I see, I see Dr. Uh, Kane's hand is raised. Yes. Um, for the very last slide that was shown, do you have that hospitalizations broken down by race? No, we don't. Um, we um, the we have race for the hospitalizations, but we don't have race for the underlying uh, for for the underlying population um, race by vaccination status. Um, that's complete enough to be able to provide um, reliably. So I, I was trying to emphasize the point with uh, the Kathy just made um, just recently that when you look at chronic conditions, it is at a much higher rate in African Americans and even diabetes with Latinos. And so I wondered how that impacted hospitalizations, but also it would help us determine. Um, and my 18 to 24 year olds who are unvaccinated uh, less likely to be hospitalized because they're healthier than say someone that is uh, 65 and older when I'm seeing all these, this very high vaccination status. So should that mean I should be um, focusing a lot of my resources on a younger age group over the age of 18, maybe to 35. But it clearly, um, if it's broken down by race, I suspect we're gonna continue to see the twice the rate of hospitalizations in African-Americans and Latinos. And if you're Native Americans, maybe even four times that rate of hospitalization. I'm just trying to see if that trend is continuing since last year. 
Yes. Yeah, so while we can't show the rates by vaccination status, we do track rates by uh, while we can't show the the rates by vaccination status by race and ethnicity. Um, we we do show um, publicly. We post the general hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity, and it does show. Um, again, it overall, um, we're not powered to show, unfortunately, rates by age, by race, ethnicity. Um, but the overall rates, um, we do see um, those patterns that you mentioned, where obviously um, there are, are differences um, within groups. Um, and that's something, and it actually, um, we're, um, we have a publication in um, that we've submitted now looking further at um, COVID net data um, by race and ethnicity because it is so important. And we've seen um, these differences since the beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, and it's important to continue to describe them in the ways that in the ways that we're able to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next I unmuted the wrong one. Uh, we'll move on to the next presentation by Dr. Amadea Britton, uh, who will provide updates uh, to COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness in the US. All right, good morning. Today I'll be presenting a summary of vaccine effectiveness data available from CDC studies, including vaccine effectiveness of both the original monovalent vaccines and updated bivalent vaccines. I will first present estimates of vaccine effectiveness, or VE, of monovalent vaccines for symptomatic infection in young children. I will then present an update on VE of bivalent vaccines against symptomatic infection for children and adolescents aged 5 to 17 years and adults aged 18 years and older. Finally, I will provide an update on VE of bivalent vaccines against severe disease with the focus on adults 65 and older. I will start by presenting data on VE against symptomatic infection in young children aged six months to five years for Moderna and six months to four years for Pfizer-BioNTech as presented in last week's MMWR. First, I would like to orient everyone to the current recommendations. For children six months to five years receiving Moderna, the recommended primary series is two doses given four to eight weeks apart. Given that dosing interval and the initial authorization date of June 18th, 2022, August 1st was the earliest date that a child could have been included in analyses for the complete series. In other words, the earliest a child receiving the vaccine could have been at least two weeks after completion of their second dose. For children six months to four years receiving the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, the recommended primary series is three doses, with the first and second doses separated by three to eight weeks, and the second and third doses separated by at least eight weeks. Since this series required an extra dose, the earliest date a child could have been included in analyses of the complete primary series was September 19th, 2022. For Pfizer, the recommended third dose was changed from a monovalent to a bivalent dose on December 9th, but this analysis was restricted to VE of monovalent doses because uptake of the bivalent dose in this age group remains too low at this time to estimate VE. For background, I'm sharing here the national coverage estimates from CDC's COVID data tracker for the primary series among young children, shown in the red box. Note that young children have the lowest coverage for either a single dose or a completed primary series, with just over 10% for one dose and just over 5% for the complete primary series in children aged two to four years. Coverage is even lower among those under age two. Children vaccinated early may be meaningfully different than those who, are, who remain unvaccinated, which may impact VE estimates. These estimates should therefore be considered preliminary. The ICAP platform includes community-based testing data from pharmacies and partners nationwide. It uses a test negative design with self-reported vaccine history at the time of test registration. For this analysis, only children whose caregivers reported symptoms and who were between the ages of three and five for the Moderna analysis and three and four for the Pfizer-BioNTech analysis were included. Children with immunocompromising conditions were excluded. 
Data are presented here for tests from July 4th, 2022 through February 5th of 2023, although the analysis start date varies depending on the dose analyzed. This was a period when the Omicron BA4 and BA5 sublineages predominated, but includes some time when XBB and related sublineages were circulating. Here we see preliminary estimates of VE against symptomatic infection for monovalent Moderna vaccine among children three to five years. In the red box on the top, we see a VE of 40% for one dose or a partial series during the interval between the first and second dose. In the red box on the bottom is VE for the complete two-dose primary series of Moderna, with a VE of 60% during the two weeks to two months after the second dose. This decreases to 36% after three to four months, though the confidence interval was wide and has some overlap with the earlier estimate. Here we see the same graphs, this time for Pfizer-BioNTech in children aged three to four years. In the first red box, for a one-dose partial series, we see CAVE of 19% with a confidence interval that just crosses the null. For two doses, which for Pfizer is also a partial series, VE was 48% in the interval between doses two and three. For three doses, the complete Pfizer primary series, VE was 31% in the two weeks to four months after the dose. There are a number of limitations for this analysis. First, as noted earlier, vaccine coverage is low in children five and under. When coverage is low, vaccinated children may be meaningfully different than unvaccinated children, potentially biasing early VE estimates and making the, le the estimates less stable over time. Second, the prevalence of prior infection among children is high. Based on CDC seroprevalence data through December of 2022, more than 87% of children aged six months to four years old have had a prior infection. If unvaccinated children have protection from prior infection, it may lead to underestimation of VE. However, as the prevalence of prior infection is so high, these estimates are likely to, resent, sorry, likely to represent the current situation among young children in the United States. Lastly, while the goal of the US COVID-19 vaccination program is to prevent se severe disease and hospitalization, the ICAP platform estimates VE for symptomatic infection only. Low vaccination coverage in this age group has to date prevented estimation of VE against more severe disease in other platforms and may impact future ability to estimate VE in this age group, including against severe outcomes. Given this context, VE against symptomatic infection can provide important insight into vaccine protection. In summary, a complete monovalent primary vaccination series helped provide protection for children aged three to five years against symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection for at least the first four months after vaccination. Some waning of the monovalent Moderna primary series might occur by three to four months after the second dose based on point estimates, although confidence intervals overlapped. This is similar to patterns observed in older children and adults in the first months after vaccination. Waning of monovalent Pfizer-BioNTech VE against symptomatic infection could not be assessed, but is also likely based on analyses in older children and adults. CDC recommends that children should stay up to date with COVID-19 vaccines, including completing the primary series, and those who are eligible should receive a bivalent vaccine dose. We will continue to monitor VE in this age group, including against severe disease and for recently authorized bivalent doses. I will now move on to present updated estimates of VE for a bivalent booster dose against symptomatic infection in children and adolescents aged five to 17 and adults aged 18 years and older. Before I present these data, I would like to review the concepts of absolute and relative vaccine effectiveness. Absolute VE compares the frequency of health outcomes in vaccinated and unvaccinated people, such as comparing outcomes in people who received an updated bivalent booster versus no vaccine at all. Relative VE compares the frequency of health outcomes in people who received one type of vaccine to people who received a different vaccine, or by comparing people who received more vaccine doses to those who received fewer doses. For example, comparing outcomes in people vaccinated with an updated bivalent booster versus monovalent vaccine only. 
In the analyses presented today, relative vaccine effectiveness can be interpreted as the additional protection provided by an updated bivalent booster among people who already received monovalent COVID-19 vaccines. Now moving on to the, to the analysis. This is again using the national pharmacy testing data through ICAT. The red box highlights the differences between the methods for this analysis and what was previously shown for younger children. Here we're looking at children and adolescents aged 5 to 17 years and adults 18 and older with COVID-like illness. Individuals with the last monovalent dose less than four months ago were excluded. Persons with, immunocompr sorry, persons with immunocompromising conditions were also excluded. Tests in this analysis were completed between December 1st, 2022 and February 13th, 2023. This includes periods of both BA5 related sublineage predominance and of XBB and XBB.1.5 related sublineage predominance. Because previously published work from this platform demonstrated that VE against symptomatic disease for these two groups was similar, we have combined these time periods. And here are the results for relative VE for children and adolescents aged 5 to 17. On the left, I show age group and vaccine dosage pattern, including the reference group, which received two or three monovalent doses and no bivalent dose. And then those who are two weeks to one month, two to three months, and for 12 to 17 year olds, four to five months since a bivalent booster dose. What we see is that relative VE in the month after vaccination is 65% for five to 11 year olds and 68% for 12 to 17 year olds with an early indication of slight waning as was observed with the monovalent vaccine. Please note that a Pfizer-BioNTech bivalent booster was first authorized for adolescents 12 and older on September 1st and for children 5 to 11 on October 12th of 2022. Moderna was authorized for children and adolescents 6 to 17 on October 12th as well. This means that there is less follow-up time for children aged 5 to 11 years, and we were therefore not able to estimate VE four to five months after the bivalent dose in the 5 to 11-year-old age group. This slide shows the same analysis, but for adult age groups, with individuals that received a bivalent booster compared to individuals that only received two to four doses of monovalent vaccine. We observe similar waning patterns across age groups. In the red box, I have highlighted the estimates among adults 65 and older, which appear slightly lower than in younger individuals. The pattern of waning against symptomatic infection is very similar to what was observed after monovalent booster doses, with VE against symptomatic infection decreasing to minimal protection by around five to six months. Now moving on to updated estimates of bivalent VE against emergency department and urgent care encounters and hospitalizations in adults 18 and older from the Vision Network. The Vision Network is a multi-state network based on electronic health records. Like ICAT, it uses a test-negative design with cases having COVID-like illness and a positive PCR, and controls having COVID-like illness with a negative PCR. VE is adjusted for age, sex, race, ethnicity, geographic region, calendar time, and local rates of SARS-CoV-2 circulation. Vaccination is determined via electronic health records and state and city registries. On this slide, I show estimates of absolute VE of two to four monovalent doses first being unvaccinated against both ED, UC encounters and hospitalizations stratified into the age groups 18 to 64 years and those 65 and older. It is important to note that the median time since last monovalent dose highlighted in the red box in the third column on the table is almost a full year for both age groups. What we observe is that residual protection against ED and UC encounters shown here is minimal for both age groups. However, it remains a bit higher against hospitalization with residual protection of 19% for those 18 to 64 and 28% for those 65 and older. Understanding that there is likely some residual protection from monovalent vaccines against hospitalization is important context important context to understand the relative contributions of bivalent vaccines shown on the next slide. We also observe that protection appears slightly higher for both outcomes in those 65 and older, which may be due to behavioral differences and lower infection-induced immunity among older individuals. Now on this slide, we show relative VE of 
of the bivalent booster against EDUC visits and hospitalizations. The reference groups here are the individuals from the prior slide who received only monovalent, only monovalent doses, with their last dose at least two months ago. Note again that most individuals in this group are almost a full year from their last dose. In the top red box are the EDUC estimates. Among these individuals, a bivalent booster offered an, an additional 50% protection against EDU, EDUC visits in the first seven to 59 days after boosting, which declined to 36% after 60 days, with the median time since dose 76 days. Relative VE against hospitalization, shown in the lower red box, was similar at 52% and 31% at seven to 59 and 60 to 119 days, respectively. Please note that although the relative trends are similar for both outcomes, residual protection prior to the booster was higher against hospitalization than for EDUC visits. And so likely total protection against hospitalization is also higher. There may also be some hospitalizations captured by the vision platform that represent less severe COVID-19 disease comparable to that of an ED or UC visit. I'll now provide an update on data published by CDC in December looking at the effectiveness of the bivalent boosters against hospitalization in adults 65 years and older through the IV network. The IV network is a multi-state VE platform that uses a prospective test negative design. For this analysis, participants were from 24 hospitals in 19 states with hospitalization between September 8th of 2022 and January 30th of 2023. Note that this analysis includes data beyond what was published in the MMWR in December. Participants included in this analysis were adults 65 and older hospitalized with COVID-like illness. Cases have a SARS-CoV-2 positive PCR or antigen test, and controls are negative for SARS-CoV-2 and influenza by PCR. Models are adjusted for age, sex, race and ethnicity, admission date, and HHS region. And here we have the updated IV results among adults age 65 and older. On the left-hand side of this slide is the dosage pattern study. We'll start first with the upper section of the, of the slide, which shows absolute VE against hospitalization for adults 65 and older, comparing people with at least two monovalent doses, but no, no bivalent dose to unvaccinated people. This result is displayed in the upper red box and shows VE of 17% with a confidence interval crossing the null, consistent with limited to no residual protection. The second estimate displayed in the lower red box is relative VE of a bivalent booster comparing individuals that received a bivalent booster with individuals with at least two monovalent doses, but no booster. The additional protection offered by a bivalent booster is 52%. Note that the median time since last dose is almost a year at 352 days. Lastly, I'm now displaying absolute bivalent VE at the bottom of the slide. This is comparing individuals that received a bivalent booster to unvaccinated individuals, i.e. people that never received even monovalent vaccine. This estimate is almost identical to the relative VE of the bivalent booster from the line above, which is consistent with the finding that the monovalent vaccine is providing limited to no protection after one year. Here I would like to briefly share some information on the COVID-19 hospitalizations included in this analysis. As a reminder, all cases included in the analysis met the COVID-like illness definition. Patients with incidentally detected SARS-CoV-2 infections with no COVID-like illness were not included. Note here, however, that of all included cases, 59% cases, had hypoxemia or low oxygen levels and 16% required ICU level care. This suggests that as with vision, there may have been some cases included that while a result of COVID-19 disease did not re represent severe COVID-19 disease. Inclusion of less severe cases may result in lower estimates of VE against hospitalization, as we know that VE tends to be higher against more severe outcomes. Oh, I apologize. I didn't advance the slide. This is, this is the slide this was relevant to. Okay. I will now conclude by, dis by discussing some limitations for the data on older children, adolescents, and adults, and summarize key points for these populations. There are several potential limitations. First, estimates of absolute vaccine effectiveness. If unvaccinated individuals are meaningfully different than vaccinated individuals, these estimates may be biased. 
Second, for, in, for interpretation of estimates of relative vaccine effectiveness, residual protection from prior doses is an important consideration. This is likely to be particularly important for severe disease, for which residual protection from prior doses may be higher than protection for symptomatic infection. In addition, interpreting waning relative VE for bivalent doses is challenging because relative estimates are also dependent on the underlying patterns of waning protection of prior monovalent doses. This means that if relative VE decreases, it does not necessarily mean the total protection an individual experiences has decreased by that same amount. Third, we have limited information on prior infection. Although just as with young children, we know rates of prior infection in, an, in adults and older children are high. VE estimates presented today are therefore a snapshot of how well the vaccine is working under current, under current conditions. Lastly, VE against COVID-19 associated hospitalization from the platforms presented today represents COVID-19 disease requiring hospitalization but may underestimate protection against more severe disease such as that requiring respiratory support and ICU level care. In summary, current data from CDC vaccine effectiveness platforms demonstrates that bivalent booster doses provide added protection compared to earlier monovalent doses against symptomatic infection in children and adolescents aged 5 to 17 years and in adults 18 years and older, though there may be early evidence of waning, consistent with patterns previously observed from monovalent vaccines against symptomatic disease. Updates to VE of bivalent booster doses against EDUC visits and hospitalization in adults confirm that the bivalent vaccines are providing protection against EDUC visits and hospitalization compared to people who received two, three, or four doses of the monovalent vaccine and no bivalent dose. For most people who received monovalent doses and are eligible for a bivalent booster, more than a year has elapsed since their last monovalent dose and they may have limited remaining protection. All eligible people should stay up to date on COVID-19 vaccinations, including receiving a primary series and a bivalent dose if eligible. That concludes this presentation. I would like to thank the numerous individuals and teams, both at CDC and at platform study sites, for their countless hours ensuring high quality data and, and analyses are available for ACIP to review. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Paling. Um, Dr. Britton, I want to say thank you. You have presented a tremendous amount of data, and I also pay. A, I also recognize that you're making sure that there's confidence and sufficient data um, to make um, estimates. And I appreciate the data you were able to show on symptomatic infection in children. Um, I am. Um, I hope that in the future when there's sufficient data that we could see the emergency department and urgent care as well as the hospitalizations in children and recognize that their rec uh, vaccination recommendations came later. So that data is probably going to lag, but that will be important for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Are there any other um, questions about this presentation? Oh, did you want to comment? Sorry. I'm just going to say that's definitely a high priority, um, and we are checking every available avenue. So, we're working on it. Dr. Kane? Um, based on the data that you showed, will this have any implications for uh, in the future? Um, how frequently we add an additional uh, booster dose, you know, like so should we, like the flu shots we're given once a year annually. Thank Can you. we give this um, booster the bivalent once a year based on this waning effectiveness? Any suggestions, recommendations? Thank you for that question, Dr. Kane. Actually, um, you uh, are prescient in that that will be part of the conversation we will be having in moments. So if you could just hold okay. that question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I don't see any additional hands raised. Thank you very much for updating us on that data. It was excellent. And I, like Dr. Paling, also appreciated seeing the positive impact on symptomatic infection in children. <laughs> um, 
Okay, next we have Dr. S oh, Dr. Sarah Oliver, back to you, We're, uh, to provide considerations for transitioning to a bivalent primary series. After that, we will have um, time for discussion. So, Dr. Oliver. Thank you so much, and yes, happy to, to say that the, the second presentation I have deals with um, uh, future thinking and frequency of dosing. For this presentation, uh, we'll talk about considerations for a bivalent primary series. Next slide. Um, so for this, we're specifically asking for ACIP thoughts on harmonizing the vaccine strain composition for mRNA COVID-19 vaccines across both primary series and booster doses. For now, what that would logistically mean would be changing the primary series from the monovalent vaccine with the ancestral or original strain to bivalent with the ancestral and BA4-5 strains for all ages. To further explain, on the left is a simplified representation of current recommendation where for most of the population, we have a two-dose primary series that's a monovalent vaccine and a bivalent booster. On the right, what we're proposing is future recommendations where all vaccines are bivalent. I'll note that for a later presentation, we're gonna talk about simplifying this primary series and booster approach for some ages. But for this presentation, we're specifically discussing using our existing vaccine framework, just potentially using a bivalent vaccine for all recommended doses. Next slide. Policy on any bivalent primary series will be coordinated with FDA for regulatory action and CDC for recommendations for use. Today's discussions are pre-decisional and there will not be a vote specifically on this. Next slide. So first to summarize the public health problem. Next slide. This slide shows the current US vaccine coverage by dose and by age. As this discussion is focused on the primary series, the eligible persons would be those who are unvaccinated currently. Then as is highlighted in this bottom row, that is predominantly children or a pediatric population. So we'll focus on this, the, the next several slides specifically around children. Next slide. This is a slide from the previous COVIDnet presentation highlighting hospitalization rates in the pediatric population. While the highest rates are among children uh, less than six months of age, hospitalization rates have varied over the last several years with an increase during that larger BA1 Omicron surge in early 2022, especially among children six months through two years of age. Next slide. Then again, a slide from COVIDnet, uh, as well highlighting underlying medical conditions in the pediatric population. So half of hospitalized children had no underlying medical conditions. Next slide. Then these are the slides um, that show COVID-19 hospitalizations by vaccination status. On the left is in green for children ages five through 11 years, and on the right in blue for adolescents 12 through 17. Across all ages and through the time frame shown, hospitalization rates were higher for unvaccinated children and adolescents. As was discussed earlier in the presentation in the uh, COVIDnet discussion, given low uptake of the bivalent boosters in this pediatric population, they aren't yet able to um, estimate hospitalization rates for children and adolescent with a bivalent booster. However, you oh, just back one more slide, sorry. <laughs> but you can still see that the lowest hospitalization rates are among the vaccinated individuals, and hopefully data in coming months will be able to include the bivalent um, population. Next slide. So here we show COVID-19 deaths in children and adolescents by year of age over the course of the pandemic. Over 1,500 children have died from COVID since early 2020 with the highest numbers of death in the youngest children and in older adolescents. Next slide. Then this slide shows death rates by vaccination status for everyone ages five and over. While we can't limit this analysis to just the pediatric population at this time, you can see that the lowest rates of death are among those with the updated or bivalent booster. Next slide. Some summary for this, children and adolescents can develop severe COVID. While the rates in children are lower than adults, nearly 1,500 children and adolescents have died from COVID since the beginning of the pandemic. 
and we can't predict which children will have severe disease. Half of the hospitalized children and adolescents had no underlying medical condition. During all time periods, COVID hospitalizations and mortality were consistently higher among unvaccinated persons than among persons who'd completed a primary series and or an updated booster. However, in spite of this, many children remain unvaccinated for COVID. Next slide. So now we'll walk through data on benefits and harms. Next slide. So the, um, available data to evaluate a bivalent vaccine as a primary series is available for Moderna using their BA1 bivalent vaccine given as a primary series to children six months through five years of age. These data were presented to, uh, at VRPAC last month and we'll summarize here today. There were 179 children who received a 25 microgram bivalent vaccine and were compared to nearly 5,000 children who received a monovalent ancestral vaccine previously. The median follow-up time for the two groups varied slightly. For the original ancestral vaccine, the follow-up time was just over 100 days, whereas for the bivalent vaccine, it was 85 days. And then this is an important note, the two studies were done at two very different time frames, so the seropositivity of the participants is quite different. For the study with the original vaccine, 8% of those children were baseline SARS-CoV-2 seropositive. Among children who received a bivalent primary series, over 60% were baseline seropositive, likely reflecting the impact of Omicron and infections over the past year. Next slide. So this slide compares the immunogenicity of the original monovalent vaccine and the BA1 bivalent vaccine. The top rows compare geometric mean titers for the BA1 neutralizing antibodies for bivalent compared to monovalent, with a ratio of 25 highlighted in the box. This clearly met the pre-specified superiority criteria. Then the lower rows show antibody titers to the original strain, the BA1 bivalent vaccine provided a boost, but the ratio was below one. However, the ratio of 0.83 did meet the pre-specified non-inferiority criteria with a lower bound of the confidence interval of 0 0.667. Next slide. Then for the available safety data of a bivalent primary series, there were 142 children who, completed, uh, who received both doses and were included in the safety analysis. Overall, the percentage of patients reporting a solicited local or systemic event was similar to or less than percentages seen after the original vaccine. However, this may be a result of the larger seropositive participants in that bivalent group. The next two slides we have, uh, we'll go over this in a little bit more detail, but the adverse events seen after a bivalent primary series were very similar to what was reported after the original vaccine in this age group. No grade four solicited adverse events were reported. There was one serious adverse event of asthma exacerbation after the first dose that was assessed as unrelated to vaccination by the investigator. Next slide. So this slide shows local reactions for the BA1 bivalent vaccine in green compared to the original vaccine in blue. Again, rates were the same or lower in the bivalent group and injection, injection site pain was the most common local reaction. Next slide. This slide shows systemic reactions for children six through 36 months on the left and 37 months through five years on the right. Again, similar patterns were seen overall with irritability is the most common in the younger children and fatigue in the older children. Next slide. Then as we think through other considerations for a bivalent primary series, we just wanted to address some concerns around imprinting as a reminder, imprinting is the concern that the initial exposure to one virus strain may prime the B cell memory and limit the de uh, development of memory B cells and neutralizing antibodies against new strains. As we now have three years of experience with this virus, we have learned that prior infection and or vaccination history likely has some impact on the subsequent immune response. We know that the risk of reinfection can vary by somebody's previous infection or exposure. This can be impacted by a variety of factors, continued virus evolution of SARS-CoV-2, time since last vaccination uh, or prior infection, and possibly imprinting. But we also know that affinity maturation can occur. This is the ability of memory B cells to mature over time, especially when exposed to newer strains. 
affinity maturation is also likely improved with more time between doses. And uh, while somewhat limited, several studies have shown that a variant-specific vaccines can not only boost, but initiate new variant-specific immune responses. However, most of these studies are focused on lab-based assays. The clinical impact of any of this, the different immune responses by prior exposure, and how it may differ by vaccination and infection requires additional research. What we do know is that vaccines continue to be able to provide a broad boost in antibody response and continue to provide important protection against severe COVID. It's also important to note that the concerns around imprinting are not if people can develop an immune response after these bivalent vaccines, but what exactly is the incremental benefit of an updated variant-specific vaccine? Next slide. So for the next two slides, we'll review the available data we have that compare the monovalent and bivalent vaccines. We've already reviewed the only data we have that compare for, that look at this for a primary series. So the next two studies look at what we have for boosters. Several studies compared antibody titers with recent Omicron sublineages for both the bivalent and monovalent vaccines. Studies range from around 21 to 42 days after the bivalent vaccine. I will say there's a slide at the end of this presentation that provides additional data, including the specific antibody levels. Um, so this is a bit of a simplification of a lot of research, um, but there's a slide there if you want a deeper dive. For this interpretation, well, so assays differ by lab and the exact level of titers can't be compared across different labs. The most meaningful outcome for this is the ratio of antibody titers from bivalent to monovalent vaccines. So that's what we've shown in the figure. A ratio of one, which is highlighted with the red line, would mean the two vaccines are equal. A ratio of over one would mean an improvement with a bivalent vaccine. And a ratio of less than one would be better titers in the monovalent vaccine. The figure um, also differentiates by type of assay done. So on the left, um, the studies done with a pseudovirus neutralizing assay um, have green text, and the live virus neutralization assays have a blue text. The bars are also slightly different shades of blue based on which Omicron sublineage was, text was tested. BA45 is in the lighter blue, and the XBB is shown in a darker blue. Overall, most studies show an improvement in neutralizing antibodies for Omicron sublineages with a BA4-5 bivalent vaccine, where that ratio would be over one. There are differences noted in the ratios of type of assays, where the improvement in the bivalent vaccine seemed to be more noted when the assay was the live virus assay. However, the clinical impact is unknown for any specific ratio or antibody level. As we all know, neutralizing antibodies at a single point in time can't convey the entirety of the immune response. Next slide. So this slide highlights the clinical data we have to compare outcomes for monovalent and bivalent vaccines. We're unable to do head-to-head -head studies comparing clinical outcomes directly in the US due to timing of the authorizations. However, these data were shown at Verpac last month and are in a preprint that's listed below. A study in the UK found a round 10% increase in relative vaccine effectiveness for the prevention of COVID infections for a bivalent BA1 vaccine. However, no COVID hospitalizations were noted at the time, so they're unable to estimate the differential impact for the prevention of severe COVID. Next slide. So overall, Bivalent COVID-19 vaccines are able to induce an immune response when given either as a primary series or as a booster. There are limited data to directly compare COVID-19 outcomes after receipt of a monovalent or bivalent vaccine, especially against the prevention of severe disease. But we do continue to know that COVID-19 vaccines have a high degree of safety. Initial safety data from a bivalent primary series trial are encouraging, but the study wasn't powered to assess rare adverse events. Next slide. Now just briefly to highlight some feasibility and implementation considerations uh, with a transition to a bivalent primary series. Next slide. This slide shows representations for the number of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine products currently between monovalent and bivalent, as well as different doses and formulations by age. Next slide. 
While the final number of products will ultimately depend on what is authorized, these are what is possible with transitioning from primary series to bivalent. We could be down to five total products. And importantly, it would eliminate lookalike vials for Pfizer and Moderna. Next slide. So overall, a transition to a bivalent primary series could improve storage space. Providers have limited storage space, and as we move to the use of a VFC program in the future, it's worth noting that VFC stock is required to be duplicate and separate. It could also reduce errors, again by eliminating lookalike vials, as well as currently one of the most common administration errors reported right now is providers giving a bivalent vaccine as a primary series dose and error. It would also allow for continued access to primary series. While the dates vary by product and age group, the majority of our current monovalent vaccine stock in the US expires within the next few months. There would be a possibility that access to primary series could be more limited without transitioning to a bivalent option. Next slide. Then just a quick note on resource use. Work is ongoing to evaluate cost effectiveness in preparation for transition to commercialization of COVID-19 vaccines. However, for this particular Question, bivalent vaccines are already purchased, delivered, and available. Transition of a primary series recommendation from monovalent to bivalent is unlikely to have a significant impact on resource use. Next slide. Next slide. So in summary, receiving a COVID-19 vaccine primary series continues to be important for the prevention of COVID-19 severe disease, hospitalization, and death. However, in spite of this, many children and adolescents remain unvaccinated for COVID. COVID vaccine recommendations that are simple to implement may remove some barriers to uptake. Harmonizing the primary series and booster doses could simplify the presentation, reduce administration errors, and allow for continued access to primary series for unvaccinated populations. And overall, when discussed with the work group, the work group is supportive of this transition of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine primary series from monovalent to bivalent. Next slide. Just want to thank everyone again. There is a team of unsung heroes. I like that um, uh, behind any of the slides we show. Next slide. So this is for the discussion. We'd love to get feedback from ACIP on this issue. However, I do want to just uh, provide two quick clarifications before we totally open it up. Um, again, a transition to bivalent primary series can only occur after FDA regulatory action and updates to CDC recommendations. There's no vote, it's pre-decisional, but ACIP's discussions can help inform actions for the future. And in addition, while we have used monovalent and bivalent designations based on the currently available products, the discussion isn't necessarily that the primary series would be bivalent or this exact vaccine in perpetuity. We know that there's the possibility that there could be updates for strains in COVID-19 vaccines. This has been discussed at Verpac. For future vaccines, really the focus is on harmonizing what we offer for a primary series and what we offer for booster. With all that said, the question to ACIP is, what are your thoughts on a transition of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine series from monovalent to bivalent? Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Oliver. And while my colleagues are thinking about some of the questions related to um, what's on the slide, I actually wanted to take a pause and go backwards a little bit, in part because um, uh, we are fortunate to have Dr. Grimes on the line uh, specific to the CICP and BICP compensation program. So, Ms. McNally, would you mind just uh, repeating the question you had from earlier? And uh, thank you, Dr. Grimes, for uh, being willing to stay on. Dr. Grimes, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for your update yesterday regarding the CICP claims um, regarding uh, COVID-19 measures. I think it's really important for the public to know that your numbers that you reported yesterday are available on your website and that my comment really related to the fact that I think that vaccine acceptance is so critical and I think that the CICP processing of claims expeditiously is important and encourages vaccine acceptance. So I wondered if you might be able to give us an update on the vaccine injury table. And if you could please explain to the public why it takes time to develop that table. I think that's really important. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So as you know, the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program provides compensation for covered serious injuries and deaths that are 
based on compelling, reliable, valid medical and scientific evidence found to be directly caused by the administration or use of a covered countermeasure. So um, in the case of COVID-19, that would include COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we uh, full, wholeheartedly agree um, the expeditious processing of claims is of paramount importance. Uh, we have had a large volume of claims submitted to the CICP, over 11,000 alleged uh, COVID-19 countermeasures, over 8,000 of those are COVID-19 vaccine related. Um, we have been processing claims as expeditiously as possible and uh, fully agree that we'll continue that effort moving forward. Um, for a the CICP, we promulgate uh, countermeasures injury tables. Those countermeasure injury tables um, for a serious physical injury to be added to a countermeasures injury table, it also must meet the compelling, reliable, valid medical and scientific evidence. Um, and those have to go through federal rulemaking to be promulgated. So that is uh, a bit of a timely process. Uh, vaccine injury table is specific to our National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program or the VICP, which is a separate process um, that currently uh, does not cover COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you so much, Dr. Rims. Thank you. Um, we'll do Dr. Paling and then Dr. Cotton. All right. Thank you, Dr. Oliver, and to all of your team and persons that contributed to all the information available in these slides. Um, I really appreciate the very systematic approach sharing all the data that's currently available as this conversation is being debated by the FDA. Um, to answer your question, I am in support of harmonization. And the reason for that is in talking to my um, pediatric and family medicine colleagues, as well as for other vaccinators throughout the state, the number of doses in the refrigerator and the lookalikes are a major source of safety concerns. And so simplification will improve the logistics, the feasibility, and the confidence of families in receiving the vaccine. The second thing I'm hearing is that families are having a hard time understanding why you're recommending a bivalent vaccine for the adult and telling them that their young child needs two doses of monovalent before they can receive a bivalent. And that has been a very confusing message. And then moving to a bivalent would be an easier communication. It would also um, improve safety in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Cotton. Thank you for all of the information you presented. This has been an ongoing issue because it's not been easy for um, people to find monovalent. I was wondering if you had any comments or if the group had considered um, what this would mean for people who have, say, undergone CAR T-cell therapy or bone marrow transplant in whom a full repeat uh, vaccination series is recommended. And would we now switch all of that to bivalent, which seems reasonable, but I was wondering if you had um, further comments on that specific topic for immunocompromised patients. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dr. Cotton. I would say, um, so for very specific points like that, we'll have to ultimately kind of defer, uh, work with FDA on language that's in the, um, th that's ultimately in the authorizations. But I think overall writ large, the concept of, for anybody who needs a primary series, really for whatever reason that may be, they would, it would be that bivalent product that we wouldn't need to keep monovalent products stocked really for kind of any um, of the indications for a primary series. But what I will say is, um, you know, if, if when this occurs, uh, we'll update the interim clinical considerations with a variety of those details. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't, you know, I don't, one of our colleagues from FDA, if you're able to comment on um, 
when you might anticipate <laughs> it would be possible to transition to a BLA, BLA. and I ask because, uh, you know, two options are in front of us. One is to continue to modify the authorizations um, for very special cases, or the second would be to allow clinicians to have the ability to um, prescribe as they think it makes clinical sense to do so. Um, Dr. Kessler, are you on the line? Yes, this is David Caslow, um, Office Director here for uh, Vaccines Research. Yes, we are working this topic um, very diligently um, and uh, are, are trying to move towards this as quickly as, as we can, but I probably can't say any more than that at this time. Thank you, Dr. Caslow. <laughs> we appreciate you being on. Dr. Long. Uh, tagging on to Dr. Paling's comments about uh, it being um, positive about the bivalent being pushed back to the primary series because of um, difficulties in safety and administering different vaccines at different ages. I would like to just speak a little bit to the new disease of coronavirus in young infants and children. You know, not only did it, does this uh, virus have a miraculous ability to change and escape uh, immune protection. It also has changed its stripes in the age groups affected, but also in the clinical diseases. So I haven't seen a, that adolescent with an ARDS kind of picture of coronavirus as we saw at the beginning of the pandemic in quite a while. We have those older children in intensive care units who are co medically complex and are on some kind of respiratory support or tracheostomies and things at home. But then we have this big cadre of younger children who have coronavirus and either high fever and seizures or fever don't know why, or this winter, lots of coronavirus plus bacterial mastoiditis, bacterial tracheitis with group A strep and staph aureus, bacterial pneumonia with necrotizing pneumonia. So there is an urgency, and this is, this is undoubtedly Omicron in these children. Um, and so there's an urgency for these bivalent uh, vaccines, these newer strain vaccines, to be available for primary series in children down to at least six months. Thank you for weighing in, Dr. Long. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, if there are other opinions the uh, ACIP committee members would like to express uh, regarding the two questions on this slide. As a reminder, you know, we're not having a vote. This is a discussion, but it would be really helpful to get on record if you have uh, particular thoughts about these two questions. In the meantime, I'm going to act, um, ask Dr. Dries if she would ask her question. Great. Thank you, um, Dr. Oliver, for a great talk, as always. And I just wanted Though you focused on children aging in to requiring primary series, I, the other population I'd like to remind the committee of is our health, new healthcare workers, either people that are just graduating from their program or people that are moving from a non-healthcare role, such as like in environmental services to a healthcare role. And we're also seeing some difficulty in people finding vaccine. And again, you know, healthcare workers are still required by CMS to at least have a primary series. And so that is causing some um, consternation and delay in bringing on new healthcare workers when they can't find the monovalent vaccine. So um, certainly Shay, I think would be in full support of this transition or at, at the very least some flexibility in allowing the bivalent vaccine to serve in, uh, as the primary series. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Sanchez is next uh, because I think our members have had a very long three days. I'm also just going to ask um, if you have any thoughts about the question, sorry, not two questions, question on the slide, and also if there's any other um, uh, uh, thoughts for why it wouldn't be a good idea, it would actually be really helpful to hear that as well. Dr. Sanchez. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Alver. I think it makes sense to move towards a bivalent um, and, you know, because that, and, and I imagine that, um, that for future vaccines, there, I'm sure there will be um, new compositions that will need to be studied because, I mean, already 
you know, we've seen a, a new variant um, than what is in the current bivalent. So, but I think it makes sense toward, towards um, to transition to bivalent primary series. I'd like to see some data on the, on the Moderna um, study. Um, I was wondering if Pfizer has similar data. And as we harmonize the, will that, will um, the, a primary series with Pfizer continue to be three doses versus Moderna two? And um, so I, I'd like to see a little bit more concrete data um, or what future recommendations may be. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sanchez. I will say we have colleagues from Pfizer on the line. Um, Dr. Kane, I don't know if there's others that from Pfizer who want to. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. I, we have uh, Dr. Sharu from the RU, our research unit, to address that question. Sharu, are you connected? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So I very much appreciate that question. Um, we are, as discussed at Verpac, currently enrolling in our dose finding portion of a primary bivalent series with the bivalent um, Omicron BA45. Um, and we will have, we're looking towards having data um, a little later in the fall. Um, as you've noted in these discussions, there's actually been low uptake and we're reflecting that also in our um, a clinical trial as well in terms of enrollment. Um, regarding your question of the three dose primary series and a simplification, that would really require FDA guidance. And I would defer back to Dr. Koslow on the next steps to allow for that. Can, can you comment though um, with the current study that you're doing, is it a three dose schedule? Of course, thank you so much. Yes, we are working as per the currently authorized vaccine on a three dose primary series. The phase one includes children six months to less than two year olds and the two to five year old age group um, with 90 participants in both of those groups for a total of 180. Um, and we're dose finding with three, six and 10 micrograms currently. Did I answer your question, Dr. Sanchez? Dr. Daly. Oh, yeah, Dr. Daly. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Dr. Oliver. To, to, to look at this specific question, I'm in support of transition from a monovalent to a bivalent primary series. Um, you know, I think, Dr. Lee, you, you asked you know, um, is there any discussion of a downside of this transition? And I think we would all say, so I'm gonna state the obvious, um, which is if there was any evidence that it was less safe or there was any evidence that it was less effective, then we would make a different decision. And I think I'm gonna echo Dr. Bell if she, I hope she doesn't mind, but Dr. Bell has said, this is the decision for today. And I think this is an entirely reasonable decision for today. I think, it just highlights how important it is that we have such strong and active and intensive monitoring of vaccine effectiveness over time, because I think what we need to do first is encourage vaccination with a primary series across the entire population, including the pediatric population. And then when achieving that, then we will have a better ability to assess vaccine effectiveness. You know, I think we need to recognize that the bivalent vaccines have half as much mRNA for strain A and strain B, and we just need to know, is that adequate protection over time? To do that, we need all the systems in place humming and working in a synergistic way, and I, I have the confidence that they will, but I just wanna highlight that, that, that this is the decision for today, and we need that continued vigilance around safety and vaccine effectiveness to continue to make good decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Dr. Long? I think the other advantage of um, the transition, again, in pediatrics would be we would have another chance to educate pediatricians and parents. This is a different vaccine. This is a different day. These are different risks because I think the current vaccines that are available for young children um, 
have been mainly taken advantage of by educated and advantaged people who really want their children to be able to go to daycare and school so they can go to work, rather than people who are thinking, my child is at risk of a serious disease because of coronavirus. And that's not true anymore. And so we have the opportunity to take this in, an, in a sidebar that children need this vaccine and they need this new one because this new virus is a risk for children. So we have to sort of uh, do disclaimers about what previously coronavirus did not do to young children. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Uh, yes, thank you. So in reflecting on the whole day, uh, we started with the information with the uh, safety monitoring. And that gives me more confidence in saying that I concur with the transition to a bivalent. Uh, as we move forward, we will have more experience, but we also will be monitoring the safety. I think what, what uh, Dr. Daly said, the reasons not to do it be a safety concern and the efficacy concern. Uh, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of simplification uh, from 11 to five vials. Vaccines don't save lives, vaccination does. And so to get it simpler for the pediatricians uh, and maybe as we get to it, the pharmacist to uh, vaccinate, I think it's important. I think it was interesting. I'm not sure uh, Dr. Daly said about the less MRI per um, per subtext for lineage of the bivalent, but I'm also thinking about that B cell maturation. So I am wondering if you have two, if you will, lines of B cells, and you can see maturation over time. Will that be helpful as we look toward new strains? I mean, by the time this comes out, it won't even be. It's not even now BA four or five or the original. So I'm thinking that perhaps a bivalent may actually be somewhat more protective in terms of uh, giving cross protection. And then lastly, I know Pfizer is saying that they're gonna do a three dose primary series. It would harmonize even more if biologically speaking, there could be a two dose Pfizer series, but that's just kind of leave that on the aside. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Uh, Dr. Dries, is your hand still raised? Oops, I'm sorry, I forgot to put it down. Thank you, Dr. Duchin. Thank you, Jeff Duchin, Infectious Diseases Society of America. Uh, this is not a question specific to the transition question. It might be more appropriate for the future directions discussion. So feel free to defer till that time. But my question is, um, are there any considerations or ongoing discussions around uh, increasing the dosing interval in the context of um, new recommendations and uh, or uh, taking into a cons uh, account a history of past uh, infection? Thank you. Thanks. I, I, I will uh, take you up on postponing that discussion until after we move. I think we do have some timing of, of doses uh, discussion in the, in the next presentation. Thanks. Dr. Sanchez. No, and, and along with that, I think we have to recognize that a lot of the data that's been presented, including as we look at bivalent dose, is that we're dealing with a, a predominantly um, previously infected population. And the, I mean, the seroprevalence rates are so high that, um, that even the data on hospitalization, et cetera, both vaccinated and unvaccinated, it's, it's very likely that many of them have had prior infection. And we know that the studies show that, that natural infection with vaccination actually is uh, optimal immunity. So I, I just want to just comment on that. We cannot forget that we're, a lot of these discussions are in a highly immune, previously immune population. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Dr. Seneas, I know your audio 
is in and out. Are you able to hear us and chime in? I, I can hear you and I will try to chime in. Um, I just also wanted to voice my support for harmonizing the primary series uh, with the booster vaccines for all the reasons that have been previously stated, including simplicity, um, access, and um, the potential for reduction of errors. Thank you so much, Dr. Sineas. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Long. So one of the things is we try to simplify all this, and you know, I don't know about, we still have to talk about a, a future, but looking at the crystal ball about the future, everybody would like to make this an annual event or maybe a semi-annual event for some seniors, senior seniors. But I am increasingly concerned because of things like we heard earlier, that maybe there was a signal, took a while to figure it out, whether there really was or wasn't a signal, in concurrent immunizations, in current, concurrent vaccines. And maybe we learned something about that that's new for influenza vaccine, that influenza vaccine standalone maybe has a certain safety profile. And maybe influenza concurrently administered with this and that has a different safety profile. And maybe it's not a new vaccine that has a concern of a safety profile or a signal or a potential signal. So it, it, it strikes me that in, sometimes in our want to be getting everyone vaccinated, vaccinated and doing it all at once, that especially with new products, we really don't have more than minor immunogenicity data that it might be okay to give this concurrently with something else. But as we pile more vaccines into what we hope will be a platform for adults for immunization, this causes me concern for safety problems that we don't anticipate, safety problems with older vaccines and not being able to know what we need to know when we recommend the schedule. Thank you, Dr. Long. So as part of the discussion we'll have a little bit later, but I, I wanted to maybe state what you're thinking in a different way, um, which is that, um, you know, there's two things. One is um, I tend to be a more pragmatic person, and I think it's, as, as was pointed out multiple times, uh, it would be we have made this vaccination schedule so complicated for our frontline providers that it becomes so difficult to even give, even if you want to do the right thing and you have the kid in your office. So I, I have a strong request and plea for simplification. So that is why I am supportive of this transition. At the same time, I do feel like there, um, uh, my request to indus our industry colleagues as well as the FDA is that I do think having um, additional data uh, would would help with vaccine confidence. And that actually is something that I feel um, will uh, not only provide uh, confidence around um, the data itself, but give us the ability to be able to reflect on that and then translate that to a broader population. Um, so I you know, was hearing a trial size of 90, which might be sufficient for the particular endpoints. But what I would ask is that as FDA is reviewing and as, as um, industry, our industry colleagues are developing these trials, that they're thinking about um, the end goal, which is really to support um, confidence in the safety and the effectiveness of these vaccines. And while we often have to use indirect measures, um, being able to articulate our confidence in that entire process would help us as we're making these decisions. So my hope also is for more data, but I really think um, it's not because I uh, have, um, it, it's because I really wanna be able to support a meaningful, effective and safe vaccination program, and all of us have that same goal. So we hope that um, this plea will go a long way. <laughs> um, all right, I don't see any other hands raised for now, so uh, why don't we break for um, 10 minutes, and we'll be back at 50 minutes after the hour.